in a thought experiment from the mid-1970s that's well known to many students of philosophy, the late Harvard philosopher Robert Nozick posed the following scenario. Suppose there were an experience machine that would allow you to have any experience that your heart desired. Neural psychologists would produce these experiences by stimulating your brain with electrodes while you floated in a tank. It would seem to you that everything was happening in real life. Wii games, online games, and virtual reality instruments would pale in comparison. You wouldn't be plagued by the chaotic and unpredictable nature of dreams and hallucinations since you would have selected the experiences beforehand. Depending on the experiences that you had chosen, it would seem to you that you were meeting great figures of history, writing the great American novel, or accomplishing other outstanding and even heroic deeds. Give your imagination free reign. Think of all your unrealized dreams pertaining to sport. The experience machine could be the solution. In your experiences, you would soar from the free throw line, arm extended, and slam home a thundering dunk on the way to leading your team to the NBA or WNBA title. Your silhouette would grace the NBA or WNBA logo. You would solo climb a new and daring route to the top of Mount Everest, without supplemental oxygen, of course, or smash 600-foot home runs without steroids on the way to demolish Barry Bonds' home run records. You would run the first three-minute mile and win Dancing with the Stars, with you, of course, being the star, on the same day. Your name would be legendary in base jumping circles, and you would soar from the cliffs above the fjords of Norway with your bat-like wings stretched open at your sides. Close your eyes and imagine your favorite scenario. What you can imagine now is only a pale reflection of what the experience machine would offer. Your inhibitions would be tossed aside, as well as your bad luck in the genetic lottery, economic lottery, and other lotteries that have held you back until now. Whatever you desire to do, you work in the words of the Nike mantra, just do it. <laughs> At least it would seem to you that you had. In Nozick's thought experiment, you would undergo these experiences for two years. After this, you would emerge and be given an opportunity to choose additional experiences. Would you choose to plug into the experience machine? And furthermore, should you? Neuroscience offers no such option, or some might say temptation, at the present time. But might it do so in the future? It's already the case that the wedding of neuroscience and technology in brain-computer interfaces is producing breathtaking hints of what might be possible. In particular, in the not-too-distant future, individuals with spinal cord injuries may gain greater causal efficacy and mobility. Even if neuropsychologists can currently offer us no experience machine as presented in Nozick's scenario, clearly neuroscience has captured the imagination in terms of its actual and potential applications. In addition, it's posing some deep questions about what it means to be a person. Indeed, we may be experiencing the dawning of a neurocentric age. In light of these factors, we face questions not only about how we can presently utilize neuroscience, or may be able to apply it in the future, but also about it how, how it should be employed by scientists and others. We're increasingly faced with questions about the normative implications of the options that neuroscience provides. With these issues in mind, in this presentation, I'm going to do three things. First, to provide some background, I'll discuss the current buzz about neuroscience as a cultural phenomenon. Neuroscience is presently being widely applied across disciplines, and this proliferation leads concerned individuals to differentiate between how we can actually apply neuroscience in the present and what could possibly be applications of neuroscience in the future. Second, I'll sketch the fairly recent development of a subdiscipline of ethics called neuroethics. As we learn more about neuroscience and about how to intervene purposefully in our brains, normative questions arise about the extent to which such interventions are morally permissible, impermissible, or obligatory including in the world of sport. In the third most developed part of the presentation, I'll consider sport as a laboratory for neuroethics. I'll single out three representative issues for consideration. The issue of neuroenhancement, the rising concern about brain injuries, including those of both the traumatic physical type and those of an insidious, though less noticeable, variety, and some potential challenges from neuroscience to cherish conceptions of sport. 
As we ponder the intersection of neuroscience, ethics, and sport, it's helpful to bear in mind three orientations. First, knowledge generated by neuroscience has a retrospective <coughs> dimension. It shines a new light on features of sport that have long been part of its history and indeed are still present in current sporting practices. Second, neuroscience has a prospective dimension insofar as it leads us to consider possible future applications of neuroscience to sport. And third, in the midst of the excitement generated by knowledge about the brain, we must not lose perspective on our moral responsibilities regarding either entrenched sporting practices or the prospects of a brave new world of sport. So the first section is the buzz about the buzz between your ears. The well-known neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran notes that for 300 years, humanity has witnessed scientific revolutions, notably those spurred on by Copernicus, Darwin, and Freud. But now, he says, another revolution is on our doorstep. Ramachandran writes, but now we are poised for the greatest revolution of all, understanding the human brain. This will surely be a turning point in the history of the human species, for unlike these earlier revolutions in science, this one is not about the outside world, not about cosmology or biology or physics, but about ourselves, about the very organ that made those earlier revolutions possible. Perhaps most of what we hear about neuroscience today pertains to relatively recent or even projected developments in the field. Significant developments have occurred since the 19th century. Currently, we're inundated with information about new brain imaging technologies that reveal structural and functional properties of the brain. Take the sexy fMRI machine, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Sexy because, as University of Pennsylvania neuroscientist Jeffrey Aguirre notes, they result in colorful images. And who isn't fascinated by magnets? <laughs> but the fRI has uh, emerged as late as the 1990s. Taking it in a broad sense, however, neuroscience has a longer history. Martha Farah, director of the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania, writes that neuroscience, if understood as a systematic study of the nervous system structure and function, dates back at least 6,000 years to the fourth millennium BCE, when ancient Sumerians chronicled how the poppy plant influences mood. Farah goes on to say that for 6,000 years, there were two kinds of advances in neuroscience. One category of advance pertains to advances in our ability to describe and explain the workings of the nervous system, including brain-based explanations of human behavior. The other kind of advance is in the area of applied neuroscience, and in particular, <coughs> the applications of neuroscience to the field of medicine. Farah writes, however the past 6,000 years advances in applied neuroscience came about, by accident or by scientific design, they were almost invariably directed toward the understanding and treatment of medical conditions. But according to Farah, the dawning of the 21st century has witnessed a third kind of neuroscience advance. This is advance in the application of neuroscience outside research labs and medical context to the home, office, school, courtroom, marketplace, and battlefield. She writes, we can now bring neuroscience to bear on solving problems in all those spheres of human life that depend on being able to understand, assess, predict, control, or improve behavior. This includes the spheres of education, business, law, entertainment, and warfare, none of which are medical applications. Indeed, neuroscience is already being applied in these spheres." End quote. Others have also taken notice of this neural trend, and in some cases with reservations. In the introduction to their book entitled Brainwash, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience, co-authors Sally Sattel and Scott Lillianfield write, clearly, brains are hot. They support this claim by calling attention to the visibly growing influence of neuroscience as evidenced by the proliferation of neural specialties. Among these, they mention the following. Neural law, neural economics, neural philosophy, neural marketing, neural finance, neural aesthetics, neural history, neural literature, neural musicology, neural politics, and even neural theology. As the title of their book suggests, Sattel, a psychiatrist and lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine, and Lilienfeld, a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at Emory University, while appreciative of careful neuroscience, are not entirely sanguine 
about all applications of neuroscience and resulting neuroscientific claims. They're not alone in seeing overreach. Indeed, they write of the backlash of charges of neuromania, neurohubris, neurohype, and from British critics, neurobulks. In spite of the backlash, we may be experiencing the dawning of an age of neurocentrism. The term neurocentrism contains diverse connotations. First, it may be used to depict widespread interest in the brain as a cultural phenomenon. Second, neurocentrism may designate the significance of the brain as an explanatory mechanism for our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Sattel and Lillianfield write, quote, the media, and even some neuroscientists, it seems, love to invoke the neural foundations of human behavior to explain everything from the Bernie Madoff financial fiasco to slavish devotion to our iPhones, the sexual indiscretions of politicians, conservative dismissal of global warming, and even an obsession with tanning, end quote. Third, as pointed out by neuroethicist Walter Glennon, explanatory reductionism, that is, explaining the mind and behavior in terms of neural events, may be coupled with ontological reductionism, a form of neural centrism that simply identifies the mind with the brain. He captures the view in these words, mental states just are brain states. We are essentially our brains. Glennon resists both explanatory and ontological reductionism, which he describes as forms of neural reductionism. In response, he writes, the brain is one part of a holistic system that also includes the mind and body of a subject interacting with the world. Despite this broader holistic approach, Glennon defends his own version of neurocentrism, in which the brain is the central, though not the only factor, involved in forming personhood, identity, and agency. Indeed, brains are hot, and the debates about the theoretical and applied sides of neuroscience are lively and robust. However, in the list of applications of neuroscience I previously cited from Sattel and Lillianfeld on the one hand, and Farah on the other, there is no explicit mention of sport, although Farah cites the field of entertainment. I'm going to address this omission. But since I'm focusing on the intersection of brain, sports, and ethics, I'll first consider the development of a subdiscipline of ethics referred to as neuroethics. Eric Racine has traced the initial use of the term neuroethics to the Harvard physician Annalise Pontius in the 1970s. She used the term while expressing concerns about interventions to speed the process by which newborns gain motility or the ability to walk. New York Times journalist William Sapphire is credited with giving usage of the term neuroethics a more recent impetus. In a 2002 meeting here in California entitled Neuroethics <coughs> Mapping the Field Conference, Sapphire defined, defined neuroethics as, quote, a distinct portion of bioethics, which is the consideration of good and bad consequences in medical practice and biological research. But the specific ethics of brain research hits home as research on no other organ does, end quote. Also in 2002, the philosopher Adina Roskies helped to delineate the field of neuroethics by distinguishing between two trajectories of the discipline, the ethics of neuroscience and the neuroscience of ethics. She argues that this twofold agenda establishes neuroethics as a distinctive discipline that deserves to be singled out within the broader field of bioethics. Neil Levy offers a hopeful gloss on the distinction between the ethics of neuroscience and the neuroscience of ethics in the following words. The ethics of neuroscience refers to the branch of neuroethics that seeks to develop an ethical framework for regulating the conduct of neuroscientific inquiry and the application of neuroscientific knowledge to human beings. The neuroscience of ethics refers to the impact of neuroscientific knowledge upon our understanding of ethics itself. Unquote. The ethics of neuroscience broadly considered encompasses a wide range of practices and issues. For example, the practice of brain enhancement through pharmacological interventions raises issues of authenticity, safety, distributive justice, possible coercion to improve performance, and the nature of personhood. Brain imaging technologies raise concerns about the disclosure of incidental findings, about privacy issues related to the possibility of mind reading, and about the feasibility <coughs> of submitting brain images as evidence in courts of law. Electrical and magnetic stimulation of the brain 
raises questions about the relative merits of paternalistic interventions versus autonomy in the light of the possibility of changing minds and the specter of mind control. Finally, brain science, by virtue of the ability to detect brain activity or the lack thereof, has also contributed to establishing criteria of death with implications for cessation of treatment. On the other hand, the neuroscience of ethics refers to the use of neuroscience to understand the nature of ethics and of moral agency. The neuroscience of ethics encompasses issues such as whether brain imaging can tell us whether rationalist and sentimentalist approaches to ethics employ different portions of the brain, and if so, whether this discovery might challenge certain views about ethical reasoning. In the bigger picture, the neuroscience of ethics raises questions about human freedom, responsibility, and dignity. Come on in, folks. Please. You're here just at the right time, right at the sports part now. <laughs> Good timing. Thanks for coming. These seats cost more. <laughs> Having broached the topics of neuroscience and neuroethics, I'll now turn to the neuroethics of sport. I've selected three representative issues. The first two issues fall, broadly speaking, under the ethics of neuroscience as applied to sport. I'll focus on the issues of brain enhancement and brain injuries. The third issue falls under the umbrella of the neuroscience of ethics as applied to sport. And there I'll look at whether neuroscience poses challenges to popular conceptions about sport. So the neuroethics of sport, beginning with neural enhancement. Imagine that you're a Major League Baseball player in the most important game of your life. It's the seventh game of the World Series. The series is tied at three games apiece. As you step through the plate as a pinch hitter with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning, a base runner representing the tying run occupies third base. The winning run is on second base. As you dig in at the plate, the roar of the crowd is deafening. Standing on the mound, 60 feet 6 inches away from home plate is the pitcher. Once the pitcher strides forward and extends his arm, that distance will decrease by up to six feet. The ball will attain a speed of 60 to 100 miles per hour, depending on what type of pitch is thrown. Once the baseball is released, it will reach home plate in 367 to 614 milliseconds. Since you are a lead hitter, of course, your response time is roughly 33 hundredths of a second. This includes time for your brain to react and for your muscles to engage the swing of the bat. The muscle response time is roughly 18 to 25 hundredths of a second. This means your brain response time is 8 hundredths of a second. Now it takes about 43 milliseconds for information about the speed and trajectory of the pitch to travel from the retina to the visual cortex. That gives you roughly 37 milliseconds to decipher the kind of pitch and plan the motor activities. Now, it should come as no surprise that it's said that hitting major league pitching is one of the most difficult tasks in sports. In fact, it's so difficult that the sequential model of deciding, planning, and executing the swing after the pitch is released is not feasible. Instead, the batter must start the process before the ball is pitched. That is, the batter is already looking for cues about the pitch during the pitcher's windup. In a situation like this, an improvement of milliseconds in response time could give the hitter an advantage. But how can this be accomplished? You might consider neurological enhancement through neurotropic substances. If so, you would not be the first to employ them to enhance sporting performance. For illustrative purposes, I'll focus on some possibilities for baseball, which has a well-documented history of the use of performance-enhancing substances, including those that have a significant impact on brain functioning. Among other substances, cocaine has been a drug of choice in the past, and there have been reports of rampant use of amphetamines. Doc Ellis is said to have pitched a no-hitter for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1970 while high on LSD. In retrospect, Ellis said, the ball was small sometimes, the ball was large sometimes, sometimes I saw the catcher, sometimes I didn't. Bioethicist Bennett Foddy writes, baseball is a quintessentially brain-centered sport. The most important weapons any player has are in his brain, the speed of his reflexes, his spatial processing, his vision, and his fine-tuned muscle memory." Quote. 
As it happens, there are drugs that can affect reflexes, mood, and cognitive processing. Foddy notes that stimulants may improve a hitter's reaction time by affecting the brain's neurotransmitter levels, which in turn affects the functioning of the brain. He claims that while some stimulants are known to have adverse side effects, such as producing anxiety, tremors, and aggression, the drug modafinil, banned in baseball since 2006, can improve reaction time, pattern recognition, working memory, and spatial planning without these negative side effects. This could potentially give you a number of advantages as you step through the plate in the bottom of the ninth. Other drugs, known as nootropics or smart drugs like paracetam, increase the level of acetylcholine in the brain. This in turn increases the brain's metabolic rate and enhances the individual's ability to focus and calculate. This too could give you an edge as a hitter. But perhaps the pressure is getting to you as you dig in to face an all-star pitcher. If so, other pharmacological aids can help alleviate these negative effects. Anxiolytics can help relieve the nervousness that contributes to choking in sporting competitions. Beta blockers are used by musicians to convey this advantage and could be used in similar advantage in a variety of sports. They're banned in most sports, by the way, organizations. Body points out, however, that drugs that might be good from the fan's perspective might not be good from the athlete's perspective. Stimulants that improve reaction time can also make athletes anxious and aggressive. On the other hand, drugs that can lessen anxiety might dilute the drama of sport if these drugs rendered athletes less susceptible to the pressures of competition and even to the possibility of choking. But aside from these issues, the possibility of neural enhancement for sport raises ethical issues. While there's no present consensus on how to adjudicate these matters, numerous factors are worthy of consideration. In many respects, the ethical issues pertaining to neural enhancement mirror issues raised by more familiar performance-enhancing substances such as steroids, human growth hormone, and erythropoietin, or EPO. One overlapping issue is the safety and well-being of the athlete. Here, paternalistic concerns potentially clash with the autonomy of the athlete. The 19th century utilitarian philosopher and staunch promoter of liberty, John Stuart Mill, championed what is referred to as the harm principle. This principle holds that competent individuals should be allowed to pursue their own vision of the good life, even at their own detriment, as long as they do not harm others in the process. This would suggest that paternalistic interventions and restrictions could be justified in the case of children or others incapable of informed autonomous decisions. On the other hand, out of respect for their autonomy, rational adults should be permitted to partake of substances even if they cause them harm. Indeed, to deny them access to neural enhancing substances would seem arbitrary, since athletes are allowed to partake of other known to be harmful substances, including tobacco. A second related argument, in that it also invokes athletes' well-being, is that if athletes are able to use a variety of neurotropic substances, others will be coerced to take them in order to keep up potentially at the expense of their own health. Robert Simon has discussed this argument in connection with performance-enhancing substances like steroids. He suggests while the term coercion may be too strong a word in this context, it's nevertheless arguable that athletes' use of potentially harmful performance-enhancing substances creates for other athletes an unethically constrained choice. Of course, if pharmacological means of brain enhancement were widely available and permitted, there could be cases of overt coercion. Coaches, team owners, and others might pressure athletes to take neurotropic drugs in order to improve their performance. That is, you might be forced to play along in order to play at all. Another potential line of criticism of brain enhancement for sport highlights the notion of authenticity. Since the rise of Prozac Nation, users of antidepressants have reflected on whether they become their true selves under the influence of psychopharmaceuticals or whether they just become someone else. Opposition to the Prozac culture at times includes a critique of superficial forms of happiness and a valorization of the melancholic temperament due to its supposed conduciveness to learning deep insights about life. At the core of the debate is a normative stance towards a supposed authentic self. But is there such a self? Some argue that the issue of authenticity is a modern construct and preoccupation. In the past, people were not concerned about their authentic selves, but rather about fitting into their assigned stations in life. <laughs> Furthermore, 
The very idea of an authentic self <laughs> assumes a kind of essentialism that runs afoul of postmodern sensibilities. But what about the issue of cheating? Isn't this an obvious objection to the use of neural enhancers, at least those which sports proscribe or prohibit? If sports have rules and an expectation that they'll be followed, won't the use of proscribed methods of neural enhancement simply be cheating? The issue of cheating is complex, and a criticism of cheating takes more than one form. In one version, cheating is viewed as gaining an unfair advantage over other athletes insofar as one makes a special exception for oneself by breaking rules. One response to this critique is that some rules are just bad rules that should be changed. A perhaps more trenchant response, however, is that some rule breaking in sport, such as the intentional foul in basketball, is conventional and accepted as part of the game. Stuart Miller discussed another timely example in an article in the New York Times just this past Sunday. It involves what's called the neighborhood play in baseball. When the middle infielder is relaying the throw from second base on a double play, he often does not actually touch second base to, to secure the force out. Nevertheless, umpires who know this typically get called the batter, base runner out. This is to afford the fielder some protection from the runner. It's a convention of the game. Thus, if it turns out that neural enhancers such as stimulants are already widely used, perhaps they too are already part of the game. If so, then according to conventionalists, the use of these substances is not cheating. Still others have argued that cheating makes an athletic contest more interesting. At another level, the charge of cheating goes to the heart of the meaning of sport. If sport is an activity dedicated to overcoming challenges, then one might suggest that the introduction of performance enhancers, including neurotropic substances, threatens the integrity of sport by allowing us to subvert or avoid the challenge. This criticism is directed in the first place, not to an advantage gained over other athletes, but rather to an unfair advantage gained over sport itself. But what constitutes an unfair advantage over sport? How do we make a principled distinction between technological innovations in sport that are legitimate, while also improving performance, and those that simply avoid the challenge of sport? Among others, the following innovations are all permitted in sport. Shoes for running events, fiberglass poles for vaulting, and graphite shafts for golf clubs. What makes these innovations, innovations permissible, while others are disallowed? Yet another potential line of criticism against neural enhancement for sport focuses on distributive justice. To the extent that neural enhancers are allowed in sports, affluent people will have easier access to them. This will mean that present inequalities will be further exacerbated as those who can afford the drugs will reap the benefits. In response, some argue that there has never been a level playing field in sports. There is unequal access to good coaching, equipment, and even good diet. If we're comfortable with these inequalities, it seems arbitrary to single out drugs that would enhance our brains. There's another thorny issue that I've yet to mention. This is the attempt to distinguish enhancement from therapy. Those who make this distinction often consider therapeutic measures to be legitimate, while enhancements, which make you, quote, better than well, end quote, are deemed illegitimate. The term cosmetic neurology has been employed for the off-label use of means of improving the functioning of normal brains. Some, however, have denied that the distinction between therapy and enhancement has merit. If a person is short and wishes to be taller, does it matter whether their shortness is due to a genetic disposition or to a glandular disorder? Others suggest that in many cases, substances can be both therapeutic and enhancing. Perhaps none of these criticisms of neural enhancement through drugs that I've discussed is sufficient in and of itself to justify a broad-based ban of brain-enhancing substances. Robert Simon has argued, however, that while no single argument would carry the day against performing enhancing substances, the ability to offer a combination of plausible arguments suggests that placing restrictions on usage is not unreasonable. Others, however, emphasize that a number of inconclusive arguments does not add up to a conclusive argument. To be sure, this is an unsettled issue. Thus far, I focused on the introduction of substances to enhance the performance of brains. But what happens when participation in sport is itself the cause of deleterious effects on the brain? 
what price are we prepared to pay for participation? So two types of brain injuries. The histories of Muhammad Ali and Jerry Quarry intersect at important junctures. In 1970, after a three and a half year forced hiatus from fighting due to his religious objections to being inducted into the United States Army, Ali fought and knocked out Jerry Quarry in the third round of a fight staged in Atlanta, Georgia. They each prolonged their careers through numerous comeback attempts and beyond the time when they were effective fighters. Each also paid a dear price. Both Quarry and Ali suffered significant neurological damage into their boxing careers. When Jerry Quarry died in 1999 at the age of 53, he suffered from Alzheimer-like symptoms. And as well known, Muhammad Ali would develop a Parkinson's-like disease. The effect of boxing on the brain had been acknowledged for decades. On May 10, 1928, Harrison Markham appeared before the New York Academy of Medicine to present a paper he entitled Punch Drunk. In 1937, the U.S. Navy surgeon, Dr. J. Millspaugh, coined the term dementia pugilistica to designate a syndrome experienced by many boxers. In the 1950s, the British neurologist, Dr. McDonald Critchley, added further vocabulary to the lexicon when he used the term chronic progressive traumatic encephalopathy of boxers. But there were still doubters. Then, in 1973, J.A.N. Corsellus, a British neuropathologist, provided the critical scientific evidence when he examined the brains of 15 boxers who had died of natural causes. He discovered that in 14 of the 15 cases, the brains had cerebral atrophy. The nature and ethics of boxing are both disputed. Some suggest that the essence of boxing is to outscore the opponent and not necessarily to cause the opponent bodily harm. Given that the sport rewards the boxer for knocking out an opponent, and that in the professional ranks, no headgear is worn, this argument is a hard sell. Nevertheless, some will argue that we must respect boxers' autonomy by granting them their desire to box. Others, however, question whether boxers make autonomous, informed decisions to enter boxing as a career, given the historically lower socioeconomic background of many fighters. Jim Perry argues that boxers are reckless insofar as they inflict blows on opponents which they know can result in significant bodily harm to an opponent. Some medical associations have called for the abolition of boxing, but to date with limited success. While the effects of, uh, of boxing on the brain have been discussed for decades, the issue of brain damage related to football has only recently gained significant traction with the public. In 2002, pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu set off a cascade of events when he examined the brain of former Pittsburgh Steelers Center and Hall of Famer Mike Webster and found it to be marked with irregular protein formations. This initiated a tug of war with the NFL that has been recently chronicled in the book League of Denial by Mark Fanaruwada and Steve Fanaru. The long-standing issue of denial has clouded the issue of whether athletes have made informed decisions about participation in football. Now that the light of day has been cast on concussions, the issue has been raised at the college and high school levels and in youth sports. And as it turns out, concussions occur at a much more frequent rate in sports than had been previously acknowledged. When the brain is concussed, it is shaken or collides with the skull. Robert Cantu, a physician and leading authority on concussions, points out a number of myths associated with concussions. These include the following. First, in order to suffer a concussion, you have to be knocked out or rendered unconscious. Not true. Helmets or mouth guards will keep you safe from concussions. Untrue. Concussions occur at a higher rate in boys than in girls. Not true. The opposite is true due to the differences in the development of the neck. And finally, it's untrue that symptoms of a concussion will necessarily be noticeable immediately after the concussion. Concussions occur in a variety of ways. When there's linear or straight line acceleration of the brain, the brain strikes the back and front of the skull, or if the impact occurs from the side, the brain moves side to side, floating in there. Particularly problematic are concussions that result from rotational acceleration. That is, when there's an off-center hit of the head, the brain rotates in the skull. But keep in mind that a concussion can occur even if there is no head contact. Concussions are no respecters of person, sex, or sports. As Cantu points out, 
ice hockey, football, boxing, soccer, volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball, cheerleading, mixed martial arts, skateboarding, tennis, and even synchronized swimming, to an extent that might surprise you, are just some of the sports in which concussions are prevalent. High school sports federations and even state legislators are beginning to address the issue as they consider precautionary measures such as removal from play and back to play guidelines, as well as preseason cognitive testing to establish baselines for comparison with post concussion testing. Debates are waged as to whether young athletes' forms of participation in sports should change in significant ways. One debate rages over whether there should be tackling in youth football leagues. Opponents of tackling argue that eliminating it would protect the brains of youths at a time when they are most vulnerable. On the other side of the debate are those who say that the elimination of tackling would fundamentally change the game and prevent youths from learning how to tackle safely <coughs> at an early age. But perhaps we would do well to consider the precedent set by John Galliardi, who coached at St. John's University in College Minnesota, the College Hill, Minnesota, from 1953 to 2012. Austin Murphy chronicled a season with Galliardi and his football team in the book, The Sweet Season. Galliardi's career coaching record was 489 wins, 138 losses, and 11 ties. A member of the College Football Hall of Fame, he amassed four national titles, two at the NAIA level and two at the Division III NCAA level. He was known for a number of coaching peculiarities, including the fact that his players were not allowed to tackle in practice. From a philosophical standpoint, a relevant issue concerning sports like football is whether participation will foreclose an open future. Because the issue of present autonomy is not as pressing for young participants as it is or would be for adults, it falls to adults to help youths make decisions that will protect their future autonomy. This issue is clouded when adults are living out their own sports dreams vicariously through their children. This phenomenon is related to another issue, a second kind of brain damage that can occur in sports. Our brains are affected by each interaction that we have. To the extent that you remember anything from this presentation this evening, it's due to the fact that neural underpinnings will make it possible. The plastic brains of young people are undergoing a critical period of development. As Norman Deutsch notes, the plasticity of the brain is a double-edged sword. It's fortuitous for us that our brains can change. However, change is not always for the better. Furthermore, according to the Hebbian learning principle, neurons that fire together wire together so that when change occurs, it's not easily undone. I contemplated these issues in a publication I call The Neuroethics of Coaching. Coaches are spending significant time, sometimes over a period of years with young people, they are affecting the brains of these athletes for good or ill. Consider the difference between playing for a Phil Jackson-esque type coach and the volatile Bobby Knight. Change your coach, change your cortisol levels, change your brain. As I've noted, this issue may be particularly acute when parents coach their own children. This was the case with tennis great Andre Agassi, whose father coached him as a youth. In his autobiography, Agassi reports that under his father's tutelage, he internalized his father's criticisms and grew to hate tennis. We may too easily dismiss the potentially negative impact of coaching on youth. Perhaps due to the influence of Cartesian and religious dualism, we may focus on the resilience of youth and overlook the impact of coaching on young brains. But there is a physical impact on their brains, as there is with concussions. Finally this evening, I want to touch briefly on the neuroscience of ethics as applied to sport. In an all too cursory way, I'll dwell briefly on human freedom in the light of the neuroscientific worldview, our sporting limitations due to our embrained human condition, and the extent to which we should be attracted by the possibility of transcending current limitations in sport by becoming transhuman through the wedding of neuroscience and technology. Some individuals highlight the role of mechanistic explanation in neuroscience and suggest that it implies a kind of determinism inconsistent with human freedom. Adina Roski's claims, however, that in the big picture, neuroscience itself doesn't settle the issue of human freedom or add anything essentially new to the discussion beyond what materialism already implies. Here, some resort to now familiar moves to suggest that the only feasible way to preserve freedom is to adopt a kind of compatibilism 
that attempts to reconcile freedom and determinism. Some also say that the intuitions of the average person on the street clashed with libertarian views that state that I could have done otherwise, given that all the factors that were operative in a given situation remain the same. But for some individuals, determinism may seem to threaten the meritocratic nature of sport. Although we can't settle this deep metaphysical issue tonight, there is a sense in which neuroscience does illuminate in a special way the limitations of our agency as embrained individuals and athletes. In his book, Why Michael Couldn't Hit, and other tales from the neurology of sport, neurologist Harold Claywins considered Michael Jordan's failed attempt to become a major league baseball player. Having won three consecutive NBA crowns with the Chicago Bulls, Jordan decided to pursue a career as a professional baseball player in the Chicago White Sox organization. When the 1994 baseball season began, he was 31 years old. Jordan entered the minor leagues and spent a season as a rather dismal hitter. According to Claymans, the endeavor was ill-conceived from the beginning. He argues that at this point in his life, Jordan would not have had the neuroplasticity requisite for learning how to hit major league pitching. He might have been able to show improvement in this regard, but it was predictable that he would not develop the neurological underpinnings to make it to the big leagues. Claymans writes, quote, there are critical periods or windows of opportunity for different types of learning. If a skill is not acquired during its critical period, then the acquisition of that skill in later life will be harder, if not impossible. Later, he adds, and Michael Jordan was not a hitting star in high school. He played basketball in high school. What chance did he have to learn to hit major league pitching? As the sport cliche goes, he had two chances, remote and none. The smart money was on none. Claymans considers numerous possible counterexamples to his timeliness thesis, only to refute them one by one. The most prominent example is perhaps that of Babe Ruth. Ruth began as a pitcher in the major leagues with the Boston Red Sox. He then transitioned to an outfielder who was a prodigious home run hitter. Doesn't this make the case that Michael Jordan actually had a chance at the big leagues? On the contrary, argues Claymans. What the example of Babe Ruth fails to acknowledge is that Ruth was a prodigious hitter, including power hitter, even while he was a pitcher, prior to his transition to the outfield. He had already developed the requisite neurological underpinnings for being able to hit elite pitching. Fortunately, after his aborted attempt at baseball, Jordan had something to fall back on, and he returned to the NBA and eventually duplicated his three-peat of NBA championships. Our limitations as ingrained individuals may lead us to contemplate the possibility of transcending these limitations by becoming transhuman. Already we've considered pharmacological enhancement. Perhaps in the future our brains will be transformed by genetic and nanotechnology that will allow us to transcend current limitations. If so, in the future, sport may look very different than it does today. Should we welcome this prospect? <coughs> Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel would likely be skeptical. For Sandel, the celebration of sport is a celebration of natural gifts. By resorting to enhancements, we deny the givenness of life and instead launch Promethean efforts to transcend our human condition. But Sandel suggests that this could backfire. For now, we are united in solidarity by the human condition. Were we able to transcend that condition, this solidarity might be threatened. Indeed, a class of transhumans might look down on individuals who did not avail themselves of technological opportunities. Coaches might criticize athletes not just for lack of effort on the playing fields, but also for not availing themselves of the latest scientific advances. In fact, if Sandel is correct, there is evidence to suggest that this is a realistic concern. In a book published in 2007, Sandel stated, quote, these days, the use of amphetamines and other stimulants is so widespread that players who take the field without them are criticized for, quote, playing naked, quote. In conclusion, as this talk has suggested, neuroscience brings retrospective insight to long-standing and still current sporting practices and offers us tantalizing prospective visions of what might lie ahead. At the same time, Sandel's argument suggests there's much needed perspective in rushing into a brave new world, or perhaps neglecting problems of sporting practice 
on which neuroscience is newly casting light. Significant ethical questions concerning the very meaning of personhood, human freedom, and finitude are at stake. To close, I would like to cite the words of the philosopher Anthony Skillen. Skillen writes that sport can teach us, quote, to live within the limits of a human fellowship informed by awareness of common frailty, end quote. For now, at least, this includes the frailty of our human brains. Thank you.